morning boys and girls my name is Miss Castillo and today I'm going to be reading a Caribbean folktale in Spanish called La Cucarachita Martina and the author is Carmen Rivera Iscoa and the illustrator Maria Antonia Ordonez and this story before I begin reading I want to make sure that for those of you who may not know too much Spanish, that you kind of get an idea what the story is about. And Cucarachita is actually a cockroach. So this story is about a cockroach, but this is not a very ugly cockroach. This is a refined cockroach, as you can see on the cover. And she will be looking for a husband. And I'm not going to tell you who the husband is, but you, as, as I read the story, I'm hoping that you'll figure that out, who she ends up marrying. And unfortunately, at the end, it's a bit of a tragedy. So you're going to try see, it. I wanna see if you can find out what that tragedy is at the end. Um, so let's begin. Um, La Cucarachita Martina. Una vez en el tiempo en que los perros se amorraban con langanizas, había una cucarachita muy sanduguera que vivía en una casita de madera en la varianda con de amor. Tenía la piel color caramelo y unos ojos de almendra muy expresivos y soñadores. Todos la conocían como la cucarachita Martina. Ma Martina era muy trabajadora. Se pasaba la mañana de aquí para allá y allá para acá haciendo los quehaceres de la casa. Lo que más le gustaba era cocinar y de los muchos platos que sabía preparar su preferido era el sancocho eso sí lo hacía sin grasa porque no quería perder su figura esbelta un día martina se levantó muy temprano y como había amanecido con muchas ganas de trabajar decidió darle una buena limpieza al patio. Enseguida agarró su escoba y se fue a barrer. De pronto vio que la grama, algo que parecía una moneda sucia y llena de mojo. Buscó un trapito y siguió limpie que se limpie hasta que la moneda quedó brillante. ¡Qué suerte! dijo Martina. ¡Es una peseta! Después de almorzar, se fue a la tienda con la peseta pensando qué podría comprar con ella. ¡Ah! ¡Ya sé! ¡Un panuelo! No, pero eso no es una buena idea. Porque yo tengo panuelos de sobra. Mejor compro chocolates. No, eso tampoco. Porque los como todos de una vez y me indigesto. ¡Ah! Ya sé, voy a comprar una caja de polvo que huela de jazmines. Así estaré bien perfumada cuando mis amigos me visiten y a lo mejor consigo un novio. Esa tarde la cucarachita se bañó y se puso un traje blanco bien coque, coquero, que un, con un volante alrededor del escorte redondo. Entonces, con mucho esmero, se empolvó la cara y el cuello y se puso dos amapolas en el pelo. Cogió su abanico y se puso en, al balcón a chazar fresco. Ahí se puso a pensar en lo bueno que sería que el ratoncito Pérez la viniera a visitar. Y pensando y pensando, se quedó dormida. La despertó la llegada de, de su balcón del señor Perro Sato, vestido muy elegante con una corbata de pajarita roja. Buenas tardes, linda Martina. Dijo el señor Sato. Qué bonitas le quedan esas amapolas. 
que lleva en el pelo. Vine a visitarla porque le quiero hacer una pregunta. ¿Se quiere casar conmigo? Eso tengo que pensarlo, señor sapo, le contestó la cucarachita. Con mucho gusto, mi querida Martina. Yo le diré, how, how, how. Me gustas más que el pegado. Ay, no, señor perro. ¿Cómo se le ocurre? Usted es muy ordinario y ladra tan fuerte que me lastima los oídos. No, mejor no ca caso con usted. Y el señor perro se despidió. Y se fue con el rabo entre las patas. Al ratito apareció por ahí el señor gato barcino, atusándose el bigote. Buenas tardes, amiga Martina. ¿Qué perfume tan agradable tiene usted hoy? Pero dígame, ¿quiere casarse conmigo? Ay, señor gato barcino. Déjeme pensarlo, porque esa pregunta es muy difícil. Primero, dígame, ¿cómo me hablará usted después que estemos casados? Ay, me pide algo muy difícil. Le diré, miau, miau, miau. Soy dulce como melao. Ay, usted es muy engreído. Señor gato barcino, además los gatos tienen fama de que se comen a los pobres ratoncitos. Váyase, no venga más por aquí. El señor gato le ardían las orejas de la vergüenza y decidió ir a la plaza a comerse una piragua para refrescarse. Iba tan azorado que por poco choca con el gallo inglés, que venía muy contento, aleteando y cantando en dirección contraria. Cuando llegó frente a la cucarachita, gallo inglés, con la gresta muy erguida, le dijo así. Amiga Martina, buenas tardes. Hoy es un día de triunfo para mí, porque acabo de ganarme una pelea de gallo isabelino. Por eso he venido a preguntarle, ¿quiere casarse conmigo? Ay, señor gallo, ese es un paso muy serio. Hay que pensarlo bien. Pero dígame, ¿cómo me hablaría usted cuando estemos casados? Por supuesto, yo le diré... ¡Qué, qué, qué! ¡Soy dueño de ti! ¡Cucurucú! ¡Tu dueño soy yo! ¡Ay, por Dios, señor Cayo! ¿No ve que ese escándalo me pone nerviosa? A mí tampoco me gustan los gallos que se deciden a pelear para divertir a la gente. Además, por ahí dicen que usted enamora a todas las gallinas que encuentra en su camino. Váyase, váyase, que yo no me quiero casar con usted. Gallo Inglés se retiró sin despedirse, con su orgullo de conquistador muy herido. Martina se levantó para ir a preparar la comida. Miró por casualidad hacia la calle y vio que se acercaba el ratón Pérez, que venía con un elegante traje gris y con un sombrero de paja con una vistosa pluma roja. La cucarachita se sintió un poco turbada. Para disimular, se sentó de nuevo en la silla y empezó a tararear 
aquello que dice Tengo una vaca lechera, no es una vaca cualquiera Me da leche a bopar, a vaporada Ay, qué vaca más jalada Tolón, 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 tolón En esto llegó el señor ratón Pérez a saludarla se quitó el sombrero, le hizo una gran reverencia, le tomó la mano con delicadez y se la besó. Buenas tardes, señorita Martina. Estoy muy orgulloso de ser su amigo porque usted es muy trabajadora e inteligente. ¿Me permite entrar para que charlemos un rato? Hablaron de las próximas elecciones, de la sequía, de la contaminación del ambiente. Cuando le pareció oportuno, el señor Pérez miró a su amiga Martina a los ojos y le dijo con mucha ternura, Señorita Martina, hace tiempo que solo pienso en usted. He considerado que usted podría ser la compañera ideal. Por eso deseaba preguntarle, ¿quiere casarse conmigo? Podría ser, le contestó la cucarachita con un gesto de coquetería. Usted también es una persona que reúne muy buenas calidades. Pero dígame, ¿cómo me hablará usted después de que estemos casados? Ya verás. Todos los días al despertarte te diré muy bajito al oído. Chui, 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 chui. Lo eres todo para mí. Chui, 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 chui. Lo eres todo para mí. Y le volvió a coger la mano y se la besó dulcemente. ¡Ay, ratoncito, qué amoroso eres! suspiró la cucarachita. Me gustas mucho y creo que puedes ser el marido perfecto. Quiero casarme contigo para estar juntos por siempre. A los pocos días se casaron, celebraron una gran boda y fueron muy felices. Cuando llegó el primer aniversario, Martina madrugó más de costumbre porque tenía muchas cosas que hacer. Quería preparar una gran cena para darle una sorpresa a su marido. Limpió la casa cuarto por cuarto hasta que la dejó reluciente. Después se fue a limpiar el patio y cortó flores para adornar la sala y la mesa del comedor. Entonces se fue a la cocina a preparar un arroz con leche, que era el postre preferido del ratoncito Pérez. En una olla puso varias tazas de leche de coco, arroz, azúcar, jengibre, pasas, una raja de canela y un poco de zumo de anís y clavo. Puso la mezcla a hervir y se fue a terminar de coser el traje que se iba a poner esa noche. Al poco rato llegó el ratoncito Pérez y aspiró los deliciosos olores que despedía el arroz con dulce. Siguió el olor hasta la cocina y cuando vio la olla, se puso ansioso por probar aquella delicia. Tuvo que subirse a un taburete para poder alcanzarla. Cuando se asomó, vio una raja de canela que sobresalía y las quiso agarrar para usarla como cuchara y sacar una pruebita. La uh, aló con la patita, pero no lo, la pudo sacar. Una vez más, 
y la tendré, se dijo. Entonces le dio un tirón más fuerte, pero perdió el balance y cayó dentro la olla. Cuando Martina regresó a menear el arroz con dulce, vio que su marido se había caído dentro de la olla y empezó a llorar y a tratar de sacarlo. Pero con mucha tristeza se dio cuenta de que ya era demasiado tarde. la cucarachita entre sollozos. Luego se fue a su cuarto a ponerse un traje de luto y una mantilla negra. Desglogó su cuatro de la pared y se sentó a llor llorar y tocar y cantar. Y en todo el vecindario se escuchaba su canto lastimero diciendo así. So that's the end. Can you tell me now, who, who did she marry? Who did she end up marrying? You're right. It was the, the little mouse, the raton, uh, ratoncito Perez. And what was the tragedy? Yeah, the tragedy was that he fell into the pot, the boiling pot where she was cooking arroz uh, con leche. And so uh, it's, it's, a, it's a sad story. But I hope you enjoyed it. I had fun reading it to you. Um, I hope you have a great rest of the day. And, and be careful out there. And take care. Adios. Hello everybody, my name is Jason Levy and I'm the music teacher from Campus International School. Today the song that I'm going to share with you takes place in Europe, in the country of Austria. I hope everybody packed all your cold weather gear because you're definitely going to need your hat and your coat while we're learning this song all about the cold snowy mountains in Austria. So come on with me while I teach you this new song. <laughs> So the song that I'm going to share with you today takes place over in Austria. Now this is not Australia. This is not with koalas and kangaroos and the Sydney Opera House. This is over in Europe in Austria where they have pretzels and bratwurst and everybody wears lederhosen. So just listen the first time through and hopefully you'll be able to pick up some of it.
Oh, an Austrian went yodeling on a mountain so high, when along came an avalanche interrupting his cry. Yo, lady, yodele he he, oh, yodele he who, shh, shh, yodele he he, oh, yodele he who, shh, shh, yodele he he, oh, yodele he who, shh, shh, yodele he he, oh, lay. So I'm going to sing a line first, and then you're going to echo after me. Oh, an Austrian went yodeling on a mountain so high. Oh, an Austrian went yodeling on a mountain so high. When along came an avalanche interrupting his cry. When along came an avalanche interrupting his cry. Very good on that first try. So first time, we have our Austrian, and he's yodeling, and yodeling is a kind of singing where you go from your low voice to your high voice, which we'll work on in a little bit. And then they also talk about an avalanche, and an avalanche is what happens in the mountains if you're way too loud, and the snow can come crashing down the mountains and have all those big giant snowballs coming after you. So you definitely have to be quiet when you're up in the mountains so that you don't cause an avalanche. So I'll sing the whole yodeling part first so you can just listen to it. Yodele he he oh yodele he who Yodele he he oh yodele he who Yodele he he oh yodele he who Yodele he he oh lay So the first one goes like this. I'll sing it first, then you echo after me. Yodele he he oh yodele he who Yodele he he oh yodele he who very good. You are definitely good at yodeling. Second one goes like this. Again, I'll do it first, and then you do it second. Yodele he he, oh yodele he who. Yodele he he, oh yodele he who. Very good. Third one's just like the first time. Yodele he he, oh yodele he who. Yodele he he, oh yodele he who. Very good. And the fourth one is just slightly different at the end. I'll do it first, you do it second. Yodele he he, oh lay. Yodele he he, oh lay. Excellent job. Now you may be noticed that the very first time that I demonstrated the song, I added some sound effects during the yodeling. And these sound effects are going to be cumulative as the song goes on. So there are going to be some different sounds each time as we change the words to the song. So the first time it was an avalanche, and we have to be very quiet during the avalanche. So when we're yodeling, we go, yodele he he, oh yodele he who, shh, shh. And we shh, shh, two times. So make sure you do that with me. So this time, try to yodel with me, and we're going to add the shh, shh in between. Yodele he he, oh yodele he who, shh, shh. Yodele he he, oh yodele he who, shh, shh. Yodele he he, oh yodele he who, shh, shh. Yodele he he, oh lay. Excellent job. So now the second verse starts off the same. We have an Austrian who's yodeling on a mountain so high. But on his journey, or her journey, they encounter a St. Bernard. Now a St. Bernard is a big dog, and that dog pants a lot. So when we get to our um, yodeling part, it'll be yodele he he, oh yodele he who. <sighs> but before I said it was cumulative. So we're going to add to it. So we'll have the St. Bernard sounds, the and then we'll also still have to be quiet so the avalanche doesn't come down. So it'll be So we'll have both sounds. So try it with me. Oh, an Austrian went yodeling on a mountain so high. When along came a St. Bernard interrupting his cry. Yo, lady, yodele he he, oh yodele he who. 
Yodelay hee hee oh yodelay hee hoo. Yodelay hee hee oh yodelay hee hoo. Yodelay hee hee oh lay. Good job. You've almost learned the whole song. So we have two more little parts to learn. Um, one of which is the third verse. And the third verse, we have a Guernsey cow that we come across. And that Guernsey cow, you can imagine, makes a moo, moo, <sighs> sound when we get to the yodeling part. So moo, moo, <sighs> and then the final one on the fourth verse, we come across an alien. We come across a Martian that's flying around in its spaceship. And that Martian, beeps its horn of its spaceship at us, so it goes beep, beep, moo, moo, ha, ha, shh, shh, beep, beep, moo, moo, ha, ha, shh, shh. So be ready for that when we do the whole song, all four verses together. So thank you so much for learning this song with me, and now we're going to go all the way back to the beginning and try all four verses. And I have my ukulele here to help us out. So you can sing with me. Oh, an ostrich went yodeling on a mountain so high When along came an avalanche interrupting his cry Yo, lady, yodeling hee hee, oh yodeling hee hoo Shh, shh, yodeling hee hee, oh yodeling hee hoo Yodelay hee hee, oh yodelay hee hoo, shh shh, yodelay hee hee, oh lay. Oh, an Austrian went yodeling on a mountain so high, when along came a St. Bernard interrupting his cry. Yo, lady, yodelay hee hee, oh yodelay hee hoo, Excellent job. Well, thank you so much for joining me today, and I look forward to teaching you some more songs next time. Again, I'm Jason Levy, the music teacher from Campus International, and I hope to see you next week. Bye! This is the MSD. I am Cleveland's Public Schools. Hi everybody, so I'm going to be talking about order of operations today. So we are going to be talking about problems that have more than one operation in them. 
and how we are going to solve them. So typically we are used to seeing problems with just one operation, whether it's multiplication, division, addition or subtraction. But today we're gonna to be talking about if there were problems that have more than one. And if the problem has more than one operation, you are gonna be using the order of operations to help you solve. So when you hear order of operations, you think you should think of PEMDAS. So that's P-E-M-D-A-S. So when you are solving a problem, you're always gonna start with the P and then the E, M-D-A-S. So I'm gonna tell you what these all stand for in a second, but to help us remember the order, you can use, please excuse my dear Aunt Sally, which sounds crazy, I know, but it's actually super helpful. I learned this when I was in fifth grade um, and I have remembered it ever since. So please excuse my dear Aunt Sally, just like when we learned our planets and we learned um, the letters and then it helped us draw them out. So the P stands for parentheses, E is exponents, M is multiplication, D is division, A is addition, and S is subtraction. So when you have a problem, if it has parentheses in it, that is the first thing you'll solve what's inside the parentheses first, always. That is always the first thing. Now, if there are no parentheses, then you're gonna start with the exponents. So if you see two to the second power, and I'll show you examples of these in a second, um, you'll start with that only if there are no parentheses. Then you'll go to multiplication, division, addition, and subtraction. Okay, so I drew out some practice problems and I have my, please excuse my dear Aunt Sally written over here, or PEMDAS. So number one, we do have parentheses. Now these are, parentheses. So 3 plus 1 is inside of the parentheses. So since P is first, parentheses is first, we're going to do what's inside the parentheses. So 3 plus 1 is 4. Now we're going to bring everything else down. 4 times 4, and then we could just solve that like regular. 4 times 4, 16. Now number 2 also has parentheses. 10 minus 5 is inside the parentheses. And then we actually have an exponent, 3 to the second power. But we always start with our P. So we're going to start with 10 minus 5, which is 5. And we bring this down, 3 squared minus 5. Now, obviously, we can't leave it 3 squared. We have to solve out our exponent. 3 to the, third, to the, oops, three to the second power is 3 times 3, which equals 9. And then you'll bring down minus 5, which equals 4. Remember, when you have an exponent, the 2, the exponent, tells you how many of the base number you are multiplying together. So 3 to the second power, we did 3 times 3. There are two 3s there. Now in our last one, we have no parentheses, no exponents. So we're going to start with... M, multiplication. So first you will do 3 times 4, which is 12. Bring down the plus 1. And then you could do 12 plus 1, which is 13. Now we have 4 divided by 2 times 3. Now, although I told you all to go in order, so please excuse my dear Aunt Sally, so technically we would do multiplication first, 2 times 3, when you only have multiplication and division in one line and addition and subtraction in one line, you're going to go from left to right. So let me draw that here. So in this number one, we only have multiplication and division. So we are actually going to go from left to right instead of starting with our multiplication. That is only when, only when, say it with me, only when we only have multiplication and division in one line. And when we only have, only have addition and subtraction in one line. Not multiplication and addition, only multiplication and division, addition and subtraction. 
So we're gonna go from left to right. So first we would start all the way over to the left. Four divided by two is two. Drop down times three. Four times three is, oh, I'm sorry, two times three is six. And again, you're gonna go from left to right. Five plus four is nine. Nine minus two plus one, you'll bring it all down. Again, left from right. Nine minus two is seven. Seven plus one is eight. Only when you have multiplication and division in one line, addition and subtraction in one line. So that is the end of the video. I just want to thank you for watching. And I also, if you watch the whole thing, if you got all the way to the end and you listen to me talk the whole time, I want you to message me the secret word, and the secret word is essential. Focus is essential. <laughs>
They were meant to show respect to the people that were around you. So by following these rules, what you were actually doing was you were creating a way of saying to people all around you, hey, I respect you. So that is the basic principle of etiquette. But before we get, so I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to actually teach you some of the rules of etiquette. Now, as we go on, you might think, wow, that's a stupid rule. You might think that is a rule that I really think that we should be doing today. Or you might think that's crazy. All of those reactions are okay, but it is important that we respect that there were different perspectives than us from what we have at the time. So we're going to go ahead and start with clothing. Now, ladies, you would be wearing a thing called a bonnet. And I'm going to go ahead and model what a bonnet would look like for you. Now, a bonnet is going to be, it doesn't have the back like a hat, okay? It kind of comes up. It doesn't really block your face from the sun, although that was the goal. And you would tie it to your head. And that was something that you always wore whenever you went out in public. Now, gentlemen, you would be wearing a hat. If you went out in public, you would be wearing this wonderful style, but probably a more current style hat. Um, one thing about their hats is, if you saw a lady that you really liked, you could take off your hat. But if you saw a lady that you didn't like, you would still tip off your hat. And if you saw a lady who you thought was a weirdo, you would still tip off your hat because that was the proper thing to do, was to always greet people respectfully. Now, gentlemen, as soon as you walked into a house, you had to get rid of your hat. And I know what you're thinking, Miss Crow, what about my hat hair? Well, I'm sorry to say it, but that doesn't matter. It was not respectful to wear a hat inside. Now, your dress, what you wore, whether you were a girl or a boy, what you wore had to go a, a couple of rules with that, okay? Number one, you dressed according to how much money you had. If you have a lot of money, you would be wearing fancier clothes, but if you did not have a lot of money, you would wear more plain and simple things. Your age, okay? So for example, babies had to always wear white. Whether they were boy or girl, they had to wear solid white because that was what was proper. So their age determined the color of clothing that they wore. Another thing is your position in society. So a man who is a house, like, who like works out on the farm or is a farmer is going to have a different wardrobe than somebody who works in finance. And so the three things that told you what to wear were your money, your age, and your position in society. Hmm. Now, a gentleman, we've already gone over the tipping your hat, but ladies, there was a special rule for you. You see, ladies, you had to wear gloves and your gloves had to be what? the whitest of white. They could not be any other color. Your gloves had to be in good shape. In fact, as I was reading some old Victorian novels, um, like etiquette books that were nonfiction, um, they said that even a yellowed glove was unacceptable. So you wanna make sure that your gloves were the whitest of white. Now, another thing about all of us is that cleanliness was important. So it was very important to be clean. Your face, your hands, underneath your fingernails, your shoes, everything had to be clean. And a big rule, reason for that rule was because people would track in dirt to their, to their houses. So being clean was very, very important at that time. Um, to fix your hair, to fix your shirt, your tie, to fix anything, you had to go into the bathroom because that was considered dressing. Another fun rule about this is that you also had to go into the bathroom whenever you had to sneeze, yawn, cough, or burp. I know, so you would just be sitting there. If you feel a sneeze coming on, you better run into the bathroom because that is considered a bathroom behavior. Even if, now that's not something that we do today. So anyway, um, I just want to reiterate, etiquette is about respect. So think about the last time that you like heard somebody burp in a restaurant, okay? It's not showing that you respect the restaurant. And so that's why they would have these rules, even though they seem a little bit crazy. Um, now let's talk a little bit about eating. So when you, if you make a B and a Z with your hands, 
The D on your right hand stands for drink. That's where your drink would go in front of you. The B stands for bread. Your bread goes in front of your left hand. So you can always tell whenever you're eating at a fine restaurant, your drink goes on your right, because it's your D, and your B goes, your bread goes on your left. So um, another thing that I want to point out that I thought was very interesting is that you could only take four bites of food and then you had to take a break. Let me explain. Now's the time to grab a snack. I can take a bite, but I can't chew with my mouth open. I have to keep it shut. What happens when I keep my mouth shut and I'm eating? I can't talk, right? And so the, what they would do is by saying that you should only take four bites and then stop, what you're doing is you're giving yourself a chance to eat, but you're also giving another person a chance to talk. And whenever you're done chewing, it now gives you the opportunity to talk while the other person eats. So it was very, um, so there were rules about that. Um, a weird rule that I thought was that there your feet always have to stay on the floor so you know how ladies cross their legs or sometimes you know we put our feet up and we kick back you know that was actually an unacceptable behavior back at the time because your shoes and your feet were gross from walking around on the muddy ground so it was actually very important that you stay clean and do not share put your feet anywhere else other than the floor um another one is that let's talk about the napkin okay this is one of my favorite rules so let's just say that you have a cloth in your hand and you're gonna actually as soon as you sit down at the table maybe you've seen somebody do this before right everybody's seen somebody do this no nope, that's actually not the proper way to do it the proper etiquette is to take your napkin and fold it in half now what you want to do is put that fold closest to your belly button. As you eat, if you get a little bit of mess on your mouth, what you'll do is you will bring the napkin up to you when it's still folded, see? And you're gonna open it up, wipe your mouth on the inside, close it, and put it back on your lap. What that's doing is that's keeping all the yucky stuff inside. Speaking of yucky stuff, let's talk about this. Back at the time, they did not have deodorant. So if you were going to do something, you didn't want to be moving around your arms. You wanted your elbows to stay pinned at your sides so that way nobody got to smell anything too funky. Um, one way that you can test this is by taking that same napkin, putting it underneath your arms and trying, both arms, and trying to eat a meal with it. Um, if you can do that, then you are properly using your etiquette skills. All right, let's talk about your drinks. So you would have a cup in front of you. One thing that we never do is pinky out, okay? Pinky out is actually not fancy. It's actually a sign of not knowing what you're doing. So people need to put their hands together. Now, you can drink your drink, but you never wanna make any noise. So you don't wanna, you know, make any slurming noises or anything. What you wanna do is you wanna put your drink to your lips, you look at your drink, not at the person, okay? You look at your drink and you drink it. Now, they say in proper etiquette, which I did a bunch of reading about, that you should never lift your glass above 45 degrees, which is here, okay? So I saw a couple other people that had some controversy with that and what they said was nothing above 90 degrees, so here. Okay, that means that if you have something left in your glass, you can't drink it. But why? But why? If you're with me right now, and you wanna go ahead and try either the drinking rules, I'm not lifting your glass above 90 degrees, or even 45, which is half of that, and the eating rules where you take only four bites, and then you must stop yourself. Now, that's also really good for digestion, just saying. So slow down your eating, it's good for your belly. Okay, now let me keep going. I actually have a whole list of these, but I only wanna pick out the most important because I think that's all that you need to know. Um, we never wanna make noise, 
So if you're ever eating a meal, you never want to make noise, like such as clinking the spoon on the cup, okay? You always would do it without making a sound, okay? Um, another rule that I thought was really interesting was that ladies were not allowed to eat all the food on their plate. No, it was seen as um, having too big of an appetite. And so what they would do is they would always leave some food on their plate and they would always leave some drink of water or something in their glass. So I thought that was very interesting. Um, another very respectful rule was that men could not sit down at the table until every single lady had been seated comfortably. So none, no moving around. You had to wait until the ladies were ready and then gentlemen, you could sit. Um, the final rule that I thought was really interesting was about dating. Can we talk about dating? So here was the rules, right? Girls and boys could not date until the girl's dad said she was okay to start dating, okay? Now here's where things get even crazier. Girls and boys did not act like they do in the movies. They would not kiss. They would not hold hands. They would not hug or anything like that. Because what was really important at that time was being, um, was, was keeping that stuff for later on. So what people would do is they would, um, if a boy was interested in a girl, he could offer to carry her groceries from the grocery store um, and walk with her home. Um, if you ever did think that you were interested in a girl, you would actually have to have someone else with you to make sure that nothing inappropriate was going on. Um, they weren't holding hands. That was considered inappropriate. They weren't kissing. That was considered inappropriate. In fact, one of the things that I read showed that it was very shocking if a lady extends her hand with her glove on, okay? If she extends her hand, she is really serious about you. She is letting you kiss the outside of her glove. Like, that is a big deal. And so I just want to point out, things change throughout history. And these people, they may have done some weird things. We, as a culture, may have done some weird things in the past, but all of it was for the purpose of showing respect. And so today we're gonna look really quickly at an article um, from a book that I've read recently. It's called The Mostly True Adventures of Homer P. Fig. I brought that up in the beginning. And what I want you to think about is this. How does knowing the history of the time period help you to understand what you're reading? How does having that background knowledge actually help you? Because it really helped me. I'm not gonna lie. So start looking for some of those things that I just talked about. You may see them, you will see them in this text. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen with you guys so that way you can see it. And let's go ahead and share. We're gonna go right here. And I'm going to go ahead and present this to you. So hopefully you can see it. So what do we do when reading sometimes just doesn't make sense, especially in historical fiction? As I said earlier, this is a story. Um, and here is the background of the story. Homer is our main character. He will be the one who's we're seeing everything through his eyes. This is a first person point of view. Um, both his parents died, so he lives with his brother. One day, his evil uncle sells his brother to the military to fight in the Civil War. This illegal action sets Homer on a journey to find his brother. Through his many adventures, Homer does hit a stroke of luck. An old Quaker man gives Homer the money to get his brother back and a guardian named Mr. Willow to help him along the journey. We're gonna go ahead and read an excerpt from this passage and I'm actually gonna take myself away from here. It says, when a fast carriage comes through, rattling over the stones, we have to step quickly to the side or risk getting run down. I want you to think about how does knowing about dirt roads and the time period actually help you to picture this? That's how we happen to make the acquaintance of the beautiful Kate Nibley and her brother. 
In her rush to avoid the carriage and keep her skirts clear of the, the filthy street, remember being clean was really important, Miss Nibley somehow bumps into Mr. Willow and ends up sprawled in his long skinny arms. Dear me, he exclaims, finding her there. Oh, oh my. Thank you, kind sir, she says, fluttering a soft pair of gloves at his twitching nose. You have saved me from ruining my dress. Sister, are you okay? Have you been injured? That's her brother, Frank. He looks like a prosperous gentleman. Have you thanked this brave gentleman? Yes, brother, she says. I let him kiss my gloves. Mr. Willow's face gets red as a ripe tomato, but he seems very pleased with himself. Kissed her gloves, did you? Why, that's basically a proposal of marriage. And who is this? Kate says, flicking her gloves on my head. Remember my? It's from Homer's perspective. Your servant boy, I can't say he's doing much for you. Something about the way she flicks her gloves. Something about that very cool look in her eyes just gets my goat. So I snatch the gloves from her hand and I drop them in the gutter. Miss Nibley stares at me in disbelief. And I'm gonna stop that and the passage actually continues to go on. But I want us to think about how does knowing these rules of etiquette and the rules of society at the time actually help us to understand this book? Some things that I noticed were this, her gloves, dropping them in the gutter. I didn't realize how important it was to have pristine and white gloves until I started doing some research. And that's when I realized our main character just did something really disrespectful. Another thing that I want to point out is as we see Mr. Willow's face gets as ripe as a tomato. Kissed her gloves, did you? Why that's practically a proposal of marriage. As we talked about, relationships between boys and girls were much different then. So by Mr. Willow kissing her glove, he was really doing something pretty scandalous and something that he should have never done to a stranger. And it was very shocking that she let him do that. Um, I just want to take a second and say thank you so much for joining us on this reading class. If I can remind you to do two things, it would be number one, um, keep reading. You guys are doing great. Um, but also when you're confused, ask the questions that you need to ask. What are you not understanding? And if you're reading historical fiction, you might have to do some research about the time period. What you're gonna find are some really cool facts, just like we did with our etiquette, that will help us to learn even more about the time period and history. So um, before I say goodbye, shout out to my fourth grade class. Hello everyone. And uh, I hope that you guys all have a great day. Thank you so much.